Good morning. How is everyone today? Sergut. I'm very well. I'm excited about our next lecture, uh, Mid-Eastern Art. Um, and this morning I'm going to announce Mr. Neil Murray. He is a retired art professor emeritus and administrator from North Park University. Um, he taught at Wittenberg for eight years as well. So anybody familiar with Wittenberg here in Ohio? Uh, Neil is also an active sculptor in all mediums, bronze, wood, metal, stone, acrylic, welding, and stone. I said stone twice, but more than one kind of stone. Um, with at least 30 one-man art shows and over 20 large public sculpture commissions. He is a mid-century modernist as far as his art style goes. Um, he and his lovely wife, Marilyn, moved here to Goldfinch at Otterbein on, in October of 2017. Welcome, Neil. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jana. Is this on? You all hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Thank you. I was saying to Jana before I started this lecture, this is always the hardest lecture I ever had to give uh, at college in the art history survey courses, simply because the Middle East is such a tangle, and it's been a tangle throughout its whole history. So it's one group against another, one dominant city-state against another, back and forth, back and forth, each one with its own particular style and artistic tradition. And it's hard to make sense out of it all for people. If you've got the outline sheet in front of you, you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of cultures listed. And actually, there's a, the last slide I'm going to be showing you is, uh, is yet another culture on top of that. We're also covering a huge span of time from before 2000 BCE up to that last piece, which is about 500 AD. So I'll do the best I can to make sense out of all of this. I'm definitely going to give time for question and answer at the end. You may have a lot of questions. I may not have a lot of answers for them, but uh, anyway, I'll try to give, give us time for that. Uh, Middle Eastern art basically is the first area. It's the Fertile Crescent. It was called that. It's no longer fertile, by the way. Now it's mostly deserts. And why is it now desert? Because it used to be fertile? Because they started agriculture there, and they did uh, all kinds of irrigation there as well. But at the time, they had no concept of salinization of the soil. So the soil ends up, the water that came there had salt content to it, mineral content. And so after, after generation after generation of that kind of irrigation process, the soil became less and less fertile. So that uh, today it's mostly kind of desert area. But it was a beautiful sort of floodplain. The Tigris and Euphrates rivers go through there. This beautiful floodplain, a relatively flat area. 
compared to next week, we're going to talk about Egypt. And this is a very, very different kind of terrain. It's a much more open terrain. As we mentioned at the last lecture, human settlements started there. Uh, the idea of agriculture, of course, was critical to that. And with agriculture became the idea of territory and warfare and so on became also a part of that, uh, that complexity. So what you have there is the beginning of urban areas, cities. By modern standards, they wouldn't be giant cities, but they are cities in, in that ancient sense of, of uh, culture. And uh, with cities, you have to have a governance structure, so you start to get a caste system, a hierarchy. Often the priest caste is the dominant original caste. A part of that eventually ends up, you end up with a hierarchy of, of a civic structure and a king on top of that. The idea of democracy, forget it. It's just not, not a part of that worldview. It, it doesn't, democracy even today doesn't work very well there. They're just, they're used to strong individual leaders and uh, it just, that tradition has continued on there. Uh, well, I think one, one thing, we might as well just get, get started here looking at the in, individual objects. I hope I haven't discouraged you too much about, about discussing this because one of the things you're going to find is the artwork, because there's not very much in the way of any kind of political unity, the artwork varies from place to place. And one thing you perhaps noticed the last time we talked about historic art, you have a dominance in the prehistory period of female imagery even in terms of a religious context, you get a dominance of female imagery. You're going to start to see male imagery become more and more dominant with this whole idea of kingship. There will also be carryovers from the ancient connection with nature and animals that we saw in the cave paintings certain animals will get associated with leadership, the dominant one being a bull. Now, can we have the first uh, slide? Sumerian culture was the, the starting culture there. And uh, this is the ziggurat at Ur. As you probably would guess, it's been reconstructed. This is not the uh, actual, this is rather the way it would look. But if you look at the upper section there, it's more or less a ruin. Well, when this thing, because of time, it's, it's mud baked, it's uh, sun baked mud brick that at one point was covered with, with a tar-like substance. But it originally was a series of steps. Keep that shape in mind because we're going to see that as being the origin of the Egyptian pyramids as well. The first pyramids were stepped just like a ziggurat is. Now the whole idea is this thing is a series of levels. The lower level has been reconstructed here with this long stairway, but there would be a series of steps if it gets reconstructed fully. And at the very top of those steps would be a relatively small temple. 
Now the temple is at the top because we're moving to an idea of religion that is not so directly associated with our earthy concept of creation. Religion starts to get uh, associated with the heavenly bodies. It moves from earth to that kind of celestial vision. So the temple at the top is kind of an uh, observatory. And the idea is it's a man-made mountain. Mountains are judged to be kind of symbols of power. And the higher you go, the closer you get to God. These ziggurats became the beginnings of a biblical story. Many of you probably heard of the story of the Tower of Babel moving up to getting higher and higher, getting close to God, and then the whole unified activity falls apart because languages get mixed up. And it's a metaphor for this whole Mideastern tangle that I've been telling you about. Anyway, this is the beginning of that sort of thing. As, as, as I say, it, it's been recreated here. Now to understand this, this would be in the center of town. Your religion is the cohesive thing that holds the community together. The priests become the sort of dominant class holding that society together. And remember, this, these things happen because of agriculture, so the farmers lived in the city. They didn't live out on the land. They lived in the city. They would go out to the land from the city and farm. And the whole agricultural enterprise allowed this sort of structure to happen. If you look at the landscape here, you can see what I'm, I've been saying about the salination of the soil. If, if, if you're wondering about that, if you look carefully around campus here, Marilyn and I live on Goldfinch, and many of you who live in these courts, if you look carefully, you'll notice the grass doesn't grow very well around the edge of your drives. Why? Because we use an ungodly amount of salt here. Marilyn and I come from Wisconsin. We don't understand why everyone panics around here where the, there's only an inch or two of snow and we dump mountains of salt on all of this. And of course, that ruins the soil around the edge of our drives. That's basically what happened there. Now, can we see the next one? These are statuettes that represent worshipers. And uh, they're, I think, uh, mostly in limestone. And they represent both male and female worshipers. And you'll notice something odd about them. They, they all have this sort of worshipful pose. Uh, but notice the exaggeration of the eyes. Now these are among the very first representations of human beings that I've showed you. Remember when we talked about cave art, we didn't have human representation because this is a world where animism is a dominant viewpoint and the thought is everything has a spirit if you give an image of, of a person, then that image can be manipulated and their spirit can be manipulated. It's kind of very similar to your modern understanding of voodoo. So they don't represent human beings very much. The eye enlargement suggests something about so some op openness to this divine insight 
some willingness to be open, the eyes receive the outer world. And so given the fact that they're worshipers, their spirits are open through their eyes of the strength of the deities that they're, they're worshiping. And notice it's both uh, male and female uh, deities or figures, worshipers. Uh, it's, it's simply a, a cluster of them. And uh, we, we're not at a point where we have a full idea of a temple. You know, this says statue, it's from the Abu Temple. At some point uh, in the spring, we're going to start talking about Greek art, and we're going to start talking about temples. And temples are, we call our churches houses of God. In the ancient world, temples literally are the house of God because the center of your temple is a cult statue of the deity, usually gigantic in scale. And it's in a special sacred room. Now, we're starting, as we're in the Middle East, we're starting to overlap with biblical history here. I've mentioned they don't like to represent individual human beings. They just represent type figures. None of these become recognizable individuals. They're simply types of figures. This whole magic idea also connects to names. So many of you are probably familiar with the fact that uh, the Jews were very, very wary of using God's name. In fact, even as late as the New Testament, Matthew will not use the name God. He uses the word heaven in place of the name of God. Because the idea is a name locates someone and the biblical idea of God, because he's greater, he's bigger than anything we know and can control. So he's beyond our control, and therefore we can't name him because the name limits him, and he's beyond our, our sense of limit. So they're very wary about about naming deities. These figures, as I say, are not deities. They're simply worshipers. Can we see the next one, please? This is a, what's called an offering stand. And we start to see the beginnings of male imagery here. This is a goat, of course, but you'll notice it's a very strange goat. If you, if you look carefully, do you see what's strange about it? Other than it's standing up? It's got clothes. Anyone? He's wearing clothes. Okay, he's, he's wearing something. Do you see anything else that seems to be associated with it? It's not totally clear. Look at the uh, what would be the left side of the figure. He's got wings. In the Middle East, you start to see this kind of composite animal. More than one animal mixed together. Uh, and the idea is you take, you're taking the power associated with that particular animal and you're adding it to this other quality. So you're getting figures that have unique power. This is the beginning of the idea of guardian uh, figures. Anyway, this is an offering stand. It's gold. And if you look at the horns of the, uh, the goat, they're in this blue stone, which is lapis lazuli which becomes very common, and you're going to see it in some other examples we're going to look at here. Uh, <clears throat> the tree idea is 
somehow associated with the goat. So the imagery in the various religions that grow up here gets pretty complicated. So the exact interaction between the goat and what appears to be a kind of flowering tree, uh, I can't fully explain to you. But notice the goat is standing on two feet, and therefore it starts to give us human sense as well. Again, that messy mixture of animal and human thoughts and understandings. Can we have the next one, please? Certain objects have a special importance for us, and this is the harp of her, and it has some of that significance. It's, it's one of the most distinctive objects from that uh, part of the world. It, I'm sure it's been reconstructed. It's hard to imagine this thing in as beautiful shape as it is right now. But uh, it's, it's a harp, of course, which meant that they uh, played music, and a, and a part of music, of course, would typically be lyrics. Musical lyrics are generally poetic in character and become basic to help us establish a kind of character uh, to our culture. He has the bull head, you'll notice. And this is the more common image that we associated with the male imagery, the bull. The bull is a gold, and his beard is lapis. And again, notice, have you ever seen a goat with a beard like that? It's, it's a kind of human-animal fusion. Their sense of category just isn't at all consistent with our understanding of categories. So it's harder to fully comprehend this. Anyway, it's a huge, beautiful object. And one of the most important parts of it is this panel in the front of it that is inlay. And that panel probably illustrates, it, there appears to be a story associated with that panel. It might have very well be related to a dominant musical set of lyrics that were sung uh, on the harp. The harp itself appears in the panel. If you look at the second panel from the bottom, you see the harp but it's being played by an animal. Uh, I can't recognize that animal very clearly, but it might very well be a goat. At the top of the uh, panel, you see here there is a male figure, and what is he doing? He's embracing these metaphors for male energy and virility and power. He's embracing bulls. Then you get this strange set of uh, panel below that where you have animals appearing to be in some sort of procession and they're carrying offerings. And again, the categories don't make sense to us. So you got an animal and what's he doing? He's offering parts of other animals. He's holding up some sort of an offering stand. And if you look on that stand, you'll see parts of other animals. Then the panel below that, you've got what appears to be maybe a goat playing the harp. And then another animal off to the side there. And I'm not sure what that is. It might be a bear. And the bottom panel, which is perhaps one of the weirdest of all of them, has a human figure that gets merged into a scorpion body. Now, scorpions, of course, can sting. So there is some kind of odd 
menace associated with this, this kind of combination. And again, next to that odd figure, there he's holding some sort of what appears to be a, uh, a roll of papyrus. And notice there's a jug there and what appears to be another roll uh, in sticking out of the top of the jug. One of the things you're probably already aware of, this is the place where writing started. This is why we no longer group this art prehistorical. The art is grouped in the historical period because writing started here. The reason I'm giving you lots of guesses about the meaning of this art is they didn't write about their art. Writing started simply as a way of keeping track of things. It was an accounting system. Given the very nature of human culture, Taxes have always been a part of human cities and culture. And writing started by simply keeping track of various produ products brought in uh, and keeping account of them. They use little tablets of clay and a stylus and started to account things that way. So it's a very simple and a, a basically what we call a pictographic way of writing. A pictographic way of writing is used as images of objects. It's not an alphabet. It doesn't work upon the image, idea of sound. It works on the idea of vision. So pictographic alphabets are gigantic thousands and thousands and thousands of symbols to be able to communicate. Eventually, the cumbersomeness of that system uh, became, became overwhelming. And they started to develop phonetic ways of communicating. A phonetic way, instead of using images, use sound. And you break down the language you're speaking in terms of sounds and create a symbol associated with each sound. So you end up with an alphabet of no more than probably 30 or 35 characters as opposed to one of thousands and thousands of characters. You're probably aware of the fact that some Asian cultures still retain the pictographic way of writing, and and therefore uh, they they actually combine the two because these the pictographic systems are very very hard to learn. The reason I mention that is the scribe becomes part of the priestly class caste, and the scribe becomes an important, really important figure in society because the kings can't read, they can't write. Very, very few people in that culture can communicate in written form. And most of the early communications, as I say, are, are in a, an accounted kind of form. So they don't talk about religion. So you get singing, you get the verbal uh, part of communication as important in the culture, but again, what does it all mean? We're not really sure. Can we see the next one, please? Yeah, let's look at uh, Victory Stelle of Naram Sin. This particular image can help you understand what I'm talking about. It's about six foot high. It's a, st a stella is a marker, like a gravestone, except it's more of a monument marker of an important victory or battle. So this is a victory stella. And you'll notice how it embodies some of the things we're talking about. Look at the very top of it. And you'll see representations 
of the sun and the moon, celestial bodies. Notice next to them a mountain. So again, the idea of getting higher up. And who is the tallest one in the imagery there? It's Naram Sin himself. You notice he's higher than anyone else in the image, and he's larger. This is a way you identify him as a king. It's what we call hierarchical proportion. The higher you are in the society, the bigger you're represented. And not only is it associated with your physical size, it's usually associated with your posture. The, the king never represented scratching his nose. The king is always represented in some sort of a dignified kind of pose. In this particular case, Naram Sen is at the top of the mountain, and if you look next to him, he, you see some of the defeated enemies that are on the ground. Some of them look like they're falling off of, of the mountain. If you look to the left of the imagery, you see some of his soldiers sort of marching up the mountain with him. They're holding staffs or spears, some vertical objects. And so this represents a, a particular victory. Again, warfare is prevalent throughout this, this part of the world. And if you're a dominant leader, you lead the army. That's how you become important. And notice the, the dates on it. It's very, very early. Can we see the next one, please? Now everything I just said is contradicted by this image. There was a uh, ruler there. His name was Gudea. Gudea was not a warrior king. But Gudea was a very, very shrewd, worshipful king. Notice his pose. He's holding some sort of a votive cup, and some, it appears as if fluid is bubbling out of that cup. His statues appear all over the Middle East. They're typically not quite life-size, and they're done in diorite, which is a very, very hard igneous rock, very hard to carve. So they have, you see what good shape this thing is. Nothing's broken, broken off. And by the way, many of these cultures did not have iron. Try to carve diorite without iron. Uh, we, we don't fr frankly understand. Same thing is going to show up next week when I show you Egyptian sculptures that are much larger than this, again made out of diorite, and they didn't have iron. Now I've carved granite. Granite is an igneous rock. It's about as hard as diorite is. And I carved it with a, a tungsten carbide tool. Uh, steel tools just end up blunting after a stroke or two. So how they carved this, I can't tell you. How they quarried the stone, we know a little bit about that. Because somehow they drilled holes in the parent rock. How they drilled those holes without iron, I don't know. Then they would put a young sapling tree that had been cut down in that hole. And then they'd fill it up with water. The tree would expand with tremendous force. And that's how they split the stone itself. Anyway, this is Gudea. He's this peaceful guy, but he's a shrewd, shrewd guy. He puts his image everywhere. This is the idea of a kind of modern 
politician. Nowadays, of course, we're all inundated almost to a sickening degree because we're only a week or so away from our education. All these images of politicians. This is the beginnings of, of uh, that kind of political leader sort of trying to ga uh, gather sort of public understanding of the quality of his reign. If you look carefully, you'll see some of the cuneiform writing on his robe itself. I'm, I'm not at all sure what that says, but it could very well proclaim his importance just like the victory stella of Naram Sim uh, explained his importance. Next one, please. Okay, we're going to start to look at Assyrian art. Now, by the way, we're going to start to be in biblical times here. You, it's hard to get these Assyrian names right. This is Asher Nasser Paul. There's Abder Nasser Paul. All of them sound the same, but they uh, reveal different kings. Typically, what the Assyrians would do, they would create, not only with cities, you, you start to get this whole role of kingship, and expanding with that idea of kinship, you get the idea of royal palaces. The king's got to have a special, special house, bigger and better than anyone else's. Now, a part of the Assyrian palaces would be these relief sculptures they're usually in limestone. And these things would be a panel going all the way around the walls of the palace. This is simply one of those panels. And the basic role of these panels is to glorify the king. And so if you, if you want the king to be glorified, you have to have him in some kind of a mean militaristic way. The figure in the chariot here with a bow and arrow is the king himself, and he's killing lions. If you look uh, underneath the horses, there is a lion on the ground, and notice an arrow sticking out of its back. The lion that appears to be attack, attacking the chariot with the king in it also has an arrow in it. Now, the whole idea is if you're king, what, what makes you king? It's power. And how, what's a better symbol for power than you killing the king of the beasts? So this simply becomes a kind of more sort of political imagery, but a much more violent character than the kind of imagery we just saw. And by the way, behind the lion, those figures there with the shields are simply part of his retinue, his warriors. Now, by the way, to help you understand this thing, they did this in enclosure, a fenced-in area. The, the poor guys in the back are the guys who had to catch these lions. They would catch the lions, release them in this enclosed area, and then the king would, would shoot the lions. As I say, I think the, the more powerful figures were those catch these things and transport them to these enclosed areas. But anyway, it's just a kind of uh, political hype. You'll notice it's a very flat relief. And this sort of flattened imagery, we tend to see it as crude. But remember, its primary purpose is to tell a story. 
we're going to see the Egyptians use the same kind of flattened imagery because there are has a political purpose. It's trying to tell a story. We don't want ambiguity here. We want you to be able to read the image and know exactly what's happening. Now, I mentioned to you these figures are uh, part of the biblical era. Most of you are familiar with the story in the Old Testament of Jonah. Now remember at the basis of that story, God says to Jonah, Jonah who's supposed to be a prophet, I want you to go to Nineveh and preach. Nineveh is the capital of this Assyrian empire. Now the Assyrians were the meanest, baddest guys in the Middle East. There are stories of armies surrendering to the Assyrians without fighting because the Assyrians treated the people who they conquered so viciously that the army would simply commit suicide in front of the Assyrians. Why? Because the Assyrians tend to skin alive those who they defeated in battle. They are the meanest of the mean in the ancient world. I've heard I don't know how many dumb sermons about the story of Jonah getting all tangled up with this idea of this guy in a fish for three days. And by the way, the biblical understanding of death and the Jewish understanding, you're not really fully dead until the third day. You know, what's the, the point of the story is not Jonah in this fish. The point of the story is God loves the Assyrians. He wants you to go there and preach to them. Jonah finally gets out of the fish, goes there. He's angry because God loves him. He doesn't love him at all. He's scared to death. He goes to Nineveh, says a word or two, and the whole city converts. And he's mad about that. So he goes out in the desert, a palm tree grows up next to him and creates leaves that shade him and all of a sudden the leaf withers. Now Jonah's mad that this leaf dies and God says to him, don't you think I care more about all those people in Nineveh than this dumb leaf that you're worried about? Anyway, th this is a culture that interacted with uh, the Jewish culture and dominated the Middle East for a few hundred years. Can we see the next one, please? Babylon Babylonia art also interacts with biblical culture because, of course, uh, the Babylonians conquered the Israelites and uh, took them to Babylon. They took them away from Israel, took them to Babylon. And in fact, the Old Testament talks about singing by, uh, the Israelites singing by the waters of Babylon uh, in the sadness that they had they could not, not be at home. This is the Ishtar Gate, was, which is in, reconstructed in a German museum. That would be the main entrance to Babylon. It's done in ceramics. And you'll notice the Eastern tradition of guardian figures at the entranceway. In this case, you have bulls, uh, some griffin-like animals, lions, various animals represented in this wall. But the, the main gate becomes the dominant sort of entrance into the city. The wall of the city probably is represented on the left there. And you see, again, it's 
ornamental ceramics. Now this starts an ancient tradition that we're gonna, we're gonna see when we move to Roman culture. In that warrior-like world, what you did when you conquered a people, you stripped them of their clothes because their clothes represented their cultural identity, who they were and where they came from. And then your conquering king put them in a parade, which he led. He would advance that parade, usually on a chariot, and march these people through the city, through this gate. So the Israelites probably came through this gate. And the idea is they no longer have cultural identity. They are now your property. You own them. They, in fact, become slaves. And this is a way, of course, of totally humiliating uh, those who you've defeated. And this becomes a tradition that the Romans practice quite a bit. And in fact, at, at some point, I'll probably show you the triumphal arch of Titus with the Israelites being marched through uh, that Roman gate as well. Can we see the next one, please? OK, this is the, uh, the audience hall of Darius, again, a uh, figure that appears in the Bible. And this is part of the Persian culture. culture. The Persians are modern day Iranians, by the way. And they play a pretty important role. We're gonna talk about them again when I show you Greek art, because the Greeks and the Persians were constantly fighting each other. Anyway, this is the entranceway to their capital. It was a giant, giant uh, complex. Uh, this is simply the entranceway. And you'll notice it's flanked by uh, guardian animals. You have what appears to be warriors in the middle there. But on either side, you have what appears to be a lion. It looks like it's attacking some sort of a horned animal. I don't know if that'd be a goat or a bull or what that would be. Probably a bull, because in a moment I'm going to show you capitals. If you look carefully uh, beyond this entranceway, and by the way, this palace covered acres and acres. It was a, a huge complex. You'll see those stand, those sort of columns. They have a funny kind of what is, is doesn't appear very clear from this distance at the top that looks like a sculpture. In a minute, I'm going to show you that. But the Persians did this grand, magnificent art. You see how it's very much associated with the flat sort of relief sculpture that we associated with the Assyrians. They, of course, conquered the Assyrians. They conquered the Babylonians. You notice the dates we're talking about here, 500 BC, we're starting to overlap uh, Greek culture here. Now, can we see the next one, please? This is what we were looking at on top of those capitals. These are giant, Capital. A capital is a sp special top to a column that helps you distribute the stress of a building. We're going to be talking much more about capitals when we get into Greek architecture. Anyway, they did these giant capitals. You'll notice there are crouching bulls. And notice there's a kind of flat spot between these bulls. Their bodies are sort of back to back. That's where a giant timber would go that would support the roof. So this great big giant timber would fit there. 
these capitals 10, 12, 15 feet high. They're big, big things. The whole idea, again, the architecture is meant to represent this special kind of authoritarian, kingly uh, power. And I want to leave enough time for your questions. One last object we're going to look at. We're showing you this particular Sasanian culture idea. I didn't even list in that thing because, again, it's another one of these multiple cultures. I don't want to confuse you. But uh, they did beautiful metalwork in this world. You could tell from the harp and the, uh, the offering stand we looked at. I'm showing this particular object. This is a king. He's hunting gazelles. And what I want you to see here, more than anything from this image, is the beginning of what we're going to call the animal style. Remember, from the east of the Middle East, you have all kinds of warrior tribes that are migrating and infusing this Middle Eastern culture. Because they, they didn't live in settled uh, places, they're migrating all the time. As a part of their art, because they didn't make settled statues, because they were moving all the time, they did small-scale art, but it's art that's part of what we call an animal style. They did all kinds of beautiful uh, brass and iron silver work with animals, and mixed with those animal shapes was what we call interlace. With their, remember, their uh, very strong tribes, think of Edel of the Hunt. They're riding horses. They, they have all this fancy saddle work and so on. And so they use leather interlaced in all kinds of ways to tie all the harnesses and things together. The animal style is a mixture of interlace and animal shapes. And it eventually dominates northern Europe. If some of you are Vikings, like my wife is, you have some familiarity with the Viking ships and the giant animals on the prows. And if you look at Viking ornamentation, you see all this interlace. If you're also Irish, like I am, you see the high crosses uh, uh, in Ireland. They're full of all of this uh, interlace as well. This is the beginning of that animal style. It's small scale. Animals dominate the imagery. And it's full of all kinds of flat sort of ornamentation, sort of growing out of the Persian and Assyrian flat way of presenting a story. OK, now we've only got a couple minutes left. I'm not at all sure I can answer your questions because the, there are so many cultures here. They're so complex that, uh, but I'll do what I can. Do you have any questions I can help you with? Yes. The, oh, thank you. Um, the statues of um, Abu Temple um, show a lot of detail. And um, I'm wondering what they could have possibly used to make that kind of detail, to carve mm -hmm. a hard stone. Yeah, well, those particular statues were limestone, which is not terribly hard to carve. Again, I've, I've done a lot of carving. I've carved limestone. Um, I don't have a good answer for how carving was done in that world. The, the thing about stone carving, 
people greatly overrate it. Now I also, I currently carve wood. Frankly, it's much harder to carve wood than it is to carve stone, much harder. Why? Because stone is brittle. If you know where to hit it, you can break off a huge hunk, which call, is called a, a spall. When you carve wood, your gouge has to touch every bit of wood. That but if you know how to carve stone, you can fracture it. And I can carve limestone at least twice as fast as I can carve wood. Exactly what kind of tools they use, I honestly don't have a good answer for that. We know they had copper. And copper, you know, they maybe constantly resharpened it. Ironically, what do you sharpen copper on? Stone. <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, I don't have a, a really good answer for that. Along with it, they melted uh, gold and the lapis in some of those. How did they manage to put that together and have it stay together? Well, I assume there were probably mechanical, essentially mechanical fittings. They could have used uh, a bitumen, which is a kind of tar that has a sticky quality to it. And that could have been used as some sort of mastic to hold things down. But uh, how they actually connected all that stuff, I'm not honestly ready, ready to say. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anything else I can help you with? Yes. How were these things surviving the wars and the destruction in the area? Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking that question, Jean, because that is a, a modern issue with especially development of ISIS. They have absolutely, because these, these objects do not represent Islamic religion or Islamic culture, they have absolutely no sense of reverence for their own history. So they've been destroying this culture even as we talk about it. Uh, how many of these objects survive? Strangely enough, what we have about this culture that has survived is, has been the stuff that those of us in the West have stolen from those cultures and protected in our museums. But they are literally destroying their own history and their own culture as we speak. Some of the slides that, at least in my book and the chapters I'm talking from, are objects that no longer exist that have been destroyed. It's, it's just a tragic, again, it's a further example of the tangle that is over there. And why, I'm not supposed to talk politically at Otterbein, but why Americans think they can go there and sort that mess out, it's a, a huge amount of cultural hubris to think we can, this has been going on for thousands of years, folks. A dominant leader, that is absolutely ruthless is the only way they understand culture to work. Any other questions I can help you with? Sorry about the political overtone there. <laughs> well, it's time for us, all of us to eat. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat>